So Ultimate Warrior holds up Vince for half a million dollars. Two people get married on pay-per-view and then divorced about a year later. And a good old dash of homophobia in a jail cell. Vince McMahon's World of Wrestling in the early 90s, everybody. I'm Joe Redland with a retro review of WWE SummerSlam 1991. Going back to Madison Square Garden after a two-year hiatus. Uh, the first one was hosted in Madison Square Garden. This actually was a pretty fun show at times. There were a couple things I will rant about. Like Ultimate Warrior, holding up Vince for half a million dollars like he ever earned even one fucking penny. And like he, you know, didn't owe everything he had to Vince. Now, I give Vince a lot of shit. And Vince deserves a lot of goddamn shit. But Ultimate Warrior was lucky to ever be in wrestling because he never belonged in wrestling. Because he was a roided up, you know, idiot that was a fucking crackpot that never fucking deserved to be there. And fuck Ultimate Warrior. I'm glad he's dead. I hope his kids grow up to be great people. His wife's also an idiot. And now that I pissed off all the Ultimate Warrior fans here, all two of you that happen to be watching, let's start with the show, The Match Made in Heaven, The Match Made in Hell. Bobby Heenan making a joke about it that I'll talk about here a little bit later. Heenan, Monsoon, and Piper on commentary. So much yelling. So much yelling on Piper's end. But that actually, at times, was good. Him and Heenan had some great chemistry. But Heenan and Monsoon were in a class all by themselves. Some people pres uh, prefer, rather, Monsoon and uh, Ventura. I prefer Heenan and Monsoon. But I totally get where people are coming from. Monsoon and Ventura were a good duo as well. So, Bulldog, Steamboat, and the Texas Tornado keeping one foot on the ground... Took on Warlord and Power and Glory uh, and Slick. And guess what? The Heels did not get a TV entrance. And that was kind of funny to me. We got this two-hour and 45-minute pay-per-view, basically. Hey, Heels, you're not going to get any TV entrance. Nobody's going to know why you're out there if they, you know, haven't been paying attention to the, you know, some of the TV. Maybe we didn't announce this match. Just go out there. What? Okay. It continued the Bulldog-Warlord uh, feud that should have, Probably ended at WrestleMania, to be honest. And Texas Tornado was also there. He was technically never eliminated from the 91 and 92 Rumbles. Both feet must touch the floor. I'm so going to hell for my jokes. And also Steamboat. Ray, I think it was like his only pay-per-view appearance during this 91 run. So I don't think he was part of the 91 Rumble. It was just, it was very odd because he was back in WCW by Layer 91 when he was Dustin Rhodes' uh, mystery partner. It was just very, very strange. <clears throat> but a crossbody, pin Paul Roma, and there we go. Fun opener, by the way. Really fun opener. One of the best uh, pay-per-view openers that WWE did in the 90s. And I would say one of the best SummerSlam openers. Not the best, but definitely fun and had a really good pace to it. And then we have Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect. Intercontinental Championship match. What do you want me to say about one of the best uh, WWE SummerSlam matches in history? Like, honestly, I would rank this top five. This, this was fucking terrific. And it, it was honestly it was honestly great. It's the greatest Intercontinental Championship match took place at SummerSlam. One of the greatest Intercontinental Championship matches they've ever done, especially in the 90s, when that title actually meant something. I mean, seriously, what the fuck do you want me to say? Now, the, besides, besides, the match is fucking classic. You can go and watch it. I'm not going to waste too much time on it. One funny thing, though, <clears throat> where Heenan was laying in the piper about his parents. That was kind of cool. But uh, Mr. Burbick was almost like going to hit the ref. And uh, Bobby Heenan says, don't don't touch that ref, uh, perfect. And Monsoon says, why, uh, why a DQ doesn't cause a title change? Okay, then nail him. Because just got Heenan at that stage, even with all the years he had in wrestling. And obviously, he, was start he wasn't necessarily slowing down there, but he would slow down a few years later. He just, so, the fucking quick wit. It's such a shame what happened to Bobby Heenan. But a sharpshooter for the win. Brett is a new Intercontinental Champion. And also, um, Perfect had a really bad back here. He actually had to be out for quite a while. He, um, you know, he, it wasn't like, you know, he didn't do anything, period. Like, he wasn't, like, laid up in a body cast. But he had a bad back, and he wanted to put over Brett, though. And you wouldn't have known he had a bad back with how he was moving. Like, he was moving really well. Also, the coach was his, um, was his uh, manager, John Tolos, who... You might know a little more history about the guy. There's got to be matches of his flowing around on YouTube. Like, he was really good in his earlier days. But unfortunately, a lot of what you hear from Tolos, like as far as stuff in the 90s, his brief appearances on UWF programming. Whew. Oh, boy. UWF by Herb Abrams. Let's hear it further. Moving on. Uh, Sarge. Um, the Sergeant Slaughter talked a little bit later, but we first get Randy Savage uh, talking to people on the 1-900 line. And first a tie-dye shirt, and then a regular shirt, um, well, regular for Savage, 
And he was just all nuts. Because of course Savage was nuts. Because Randy Savage was nuts. And I love the guy. One of my favorite wrestlers of all time with these fucking nuts. And then we get the Natural Disasters with Jimmy Hart versus the Bushwhackers with Andre the Giant. Oh, dear. Whew. Bushwhackers really were wiped out by this point. Andre was really sad to see him in this kind of shape because he couldn't wrestle on WWE programming anymore. And I think he might have wrestled on a few house shows, but I think by 90, by summer 91, he was basically done. He was making appearances in Mexico and Japan, but mostly in six mans because he loved wrestling. But oh boy, the big one, the, you know, the, the sit down, squat and push that Earthquake does, pin Luke, I believe. And then they were trying to get to Andre. And then um, LOD comes out and confronts him. He's like, no, you will not touch this very beaten up giant that we must protect. And it's just really sad to see Andre at this point. It's really, it's really sad looking at some of these pay-per-views. And I know like this one's, you know, 29 years old. But just looking at it and you're like, God, so many people are dead. And some of them, like, did not make it out of the decade. Like, that's really kind of the scary thing about it. But enough depressing stuff. Let's talk about... That match wasn't very good, though. It just wasn't. The Bushwhackers had a good comedy gimmick, and it got a lot of years for them in the ring. But fucking hell. Just, you, they couldn't do anything. And Natural Disasters, Typhoon, Earthquake, you couldn't really do much with them either. They needed guys to work with that could, they could bump off. It just wasn't good. So then Heenan uh, tries to get into Hogan's uh, locker room. And, you know, he has the real world's championship because Ric Flair had jumped to the WWF. Because Jim Hurd was a fucking idiot. Once again, Jim Hurd was a fucking idiot. Him and Vince Russo are in a competition for, like, how much more, how much damage each one's done to wrestling. <clears throat> and so, we think of Teddy DiBiase versus Virgil. Million dollar championship match. I never cared for this. This feud was fine, but should have culminated at Mania 7. I mean, I know it culminated, it was supposed to be maybe Piper versus DiBiase, but that had happened. They had put Virgil in, uh, Piper was in an accident, a motorcycle accident. And yes, they had the one of the biggest, uh, probably the biggest pop Virgil ever got when he waffled uh, Ted DiBiase with the uh, championship at the 91 Rumble after their mix, or at, mix tag, after their tag match that they had against Dustin and Dusty. Dusty's last match with the company before he returned to WCW. But it went on too long. Virgil was very green at this point. Virgil was never very good in the ring. Ted did all he could. Cherry interfered and caused a DQ. Aha, but the ref says, nope, the match is going to continue, Sherry, you need to leave. Because Virgil almost had him beat with the Million Dollar Dream. And then we get uh, Ted yelling at Piper, and then he lays out Virgil, beats him up, suplexes him, that kind of all of this. Turnbuckle spot where um, Ted gets rammed into it, and then eventually Virgil tops him. One, two, three. Million Dollar Championship was won by Virgil. And that I think that was the last appearance. I don't think it was defended again. It was pretty much forgotten about after the 92 Rumble, like which is fine because it really only should have ever been on Ted. It was only given to him because he did not win the uh, Mania 4 tournament. And they wanted to have, find a way for him to stick around. To be fair, though, I think it was smart for Ted to stick around because he made more money. And I, I don't think he, unless he went to All Japan, I don't think he would have made nearly as much as he would have for Vince. At least that's my opinion. I don't think WCW would have really used a guy, especially by that point. And it was fine. The Mountie then yells at the cops, uh, hyping up the jailhouse match, says, I want you to beat him up. Don't treat him like New York cops usually do. Clearly, the Mountie has not paid attention to a lot of footage. That was in the future. Moving on. Um, he basically says beat him up and everything. Handcuff him. Don't treat, don't treat him good. And then we get the big boss man versus the Mountie Jail House match. Loser goes to jail. Mmm. It's a prime example of gimmicks being put on guys that probably should have been able to make a match work better than it did. I mean, yeah, it was what it was. It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Boss man eventually would win with an Alabama slam variation. And then Mountie would get ca card up to jail. Mountie tried everything with Jimmy Hart to, like, the shock stick and all that to, like, get the victory, but he couldn't. And he got hauled away. And he's cuffed, taken away. We see them drive him away and stuff like that. And then they hype up Hulk Hogan, real American story on pay-per-view. Okay. Great. Hogan on, H Hogan on camera talking about his life. That'll go well. That won't backfire on him in 2000-some-odd whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, when they were doing these pay-per-views, it was really, really odd. 
because then it would just become a Coliseum home video uh, release, I believe. And then Ted DiBiase yells about... A lot of yelling in these promos here after this. Ted DiBiase yells about losing the title. And then Brett's happy about the Intercontinental Championship. Bossman yells about winning the match. And then we get more footage of the Mountie going to jail. And then Jimmy Hart's upset. My lawyers will hear about this. Da, 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 da. They fingerprint him, not Jimmy Hart. That would have been weird if they somehow got him to jail despite him being in the arena. And they fingerprinted the Mountie. And then Slar's upset. Sid promises justice will be served. Because he said, Justice, do you fucking get it? We then get the Nasty Boys versus LOD tag title match. No DQ. It's a brawl. Essentially a brawl. It was messy. Because the Nasty Boys matches are usually messy. And then uh, Helmet Shut and the Doomsday Device. One, two, three. Jerry Sags gets pinned. LOD win the WWF Tag Team Championship. So they won, they won the titles of Crockett. They won the titles in AWA. There you go. Three major championships won all the companies. I mean, granted, by this point, the AWA was done. But still, AWA, you know, and uh, <clears throat> NWA Tag Team Championships and these, that's a pretty damn big deal. Um, they only held them till just after the 92 Rumble because then Hawk got suspended. But it was what it was. Poor Hawk. Mountie was in jail. More footage of it. And an IRS versus Greg Valentine. Why, why, and I ask again, why was this on pay-per-view in 91? IRS just needed to get a win. Uh, inside Cradle, he reversed, a, or he countered the figure four into an inside Cradle. It was a match. Should have been on Superstars. And then, um, uh, Heenan, and, he, Heenan and Monsoon and Piper talk about what match is next. And they said, the match made in hell or whatever. And he's like, and he says, the wedding's next? Like, no, it's like, no, the match made in hell. Well, you said the wedding. Will you be serious? It's just fucking hell. Because he and a monsoon were gold. I haven't mentioned that. So, Warrior and Hogan yell so much. So many roids. So many roids. Not that they were the only ones. Because Sid was also the ref for this. I know a lot of people did roids. But fucking Christ. Christ. Why so many roids? Warrior and Hogan versus Slaughter, General Adnan, and Colonel Mustafa, who they referred to kind of as the Iron Sheik, yet didn't call him the Iron Sheik. Okay, this match is most remembered for the fact that Ultimate Warrior chased Adnan and Mustafa to the back. Warrior must have been like, you know, it should have just walked, it should have just waited until they were at the curtain and then chased them, because Adnan couldn't run and Mustafa couldn't run. This is most known for the fact that Ultimate Warrior held up Vince for a whole bunch of money. Money he felt he was owed for WrestleMania 7 because he felt he deserved equal pay to Hogan. Okay, Warrior did beat Hogan at Mania 6. Warrior also didn't deserve any of the money that he got. I mean, I'm sorry. There was so much money that he got paid and he never fucking deserved it. And I'll stand by that. I will stand by that till the day I go in the fucking grave or get shot into space, whichever comes first, type Nae style. This is a prime example of a guy not appreciating his spot. Now, am I saying that Vince has not been a shrewd businessman, has not been a jackass, and will not atone for the many bad things he's done? Oh, fuck yeah, he will. But he was right for how he dealt with Warrior. He gave Warrior everything. He gave him everything. And Warrior believed his own goddamn hype. He's a goddamn crackpot, a goddamn idiot. No, fuck Ultimate Warrior. I'm glad he's dead. Just need to drive that home. Look, Ultimate Warrior's a fucking idiot. He's a fucking idiot for this. Oh, I'm burned down and everything, this kind of stuff. The road life's got to be tough. But you didn't have to stick around, Warrior. That's so stupid. He changed his name to Warrior because he was a fucking idiot. Fucking goddamn moron. Again, glad he's dead. And then we get... He chases him to the back. And Vince fires him. Thank fuck he fired him. Of course, he brought him back by Manny 8. And they had the Papa Shango feud. Oh, boy. That was the right move. You get it? Charles Wright. Charles Wright. Anyway, powder and leg drop and Hogan pin Slaughter. So it was the last appearance of Slaughter as an Iraqi sympathizer. So yeah, all that stuff of maybe like, you know, getting threats like against his family and everything and all that. That was done in about 10 months. Hopefully it was worth it, Slaughter, because then he was back to being a babyface by uh, Survivor Series 91. Which then... Uh, was followed by Tuesday in Texas, literally six days later. That was a good idea. They tested the weekly pay-per-view concept, and it didn't fucking work. At least NWA TNA offered some good shit. They offered us Tuesday in Texas, WWE did. 
All right. Hogan and Celebrates call Sid out to join. Sid was much more physically impressive by this point. Um, and Sid was much more over. Sid got a big pop. And then the Mountie's in jail. And then he yells at a guy and says, you want to fight? It's like, you want to fight my friend? Well, here's my friend. And this biker guy shows up that looks like he should have been a discount version. The way he's dressed and the way he's acting like a discount version of the YMCA, the guy from the YMCA, or even maybe the basis of Mr. Slave from, you know, uh, for South Park. But he says, don't you love the feel of, and I'm not going to even try to do the voice. It was so goddamn offensive. Um, you, you, don't you love the feel of leather against your skin? And about he screamed. <laughs> now, I wouldn't want to be in jail. Thankfully, I never will be. Because I'm a smart person and I don't want to get caught for crimes. That's why I use the fall guy. Moving on. But the implied stuff here. Look. I mean, I'm not saying that some things can't be funny. This wasn't even funny. I don't even know if it was necessarily the most offensive thing I saw on WWE programming by this point. But it was just really dumb where I'm just like, why did they need to do that? Why? Why are we just having this uh, YMCA, you know, this village people reject guy just show up? What the fuck is that about? Ah, this is ridiculous. Match made in heaven. Video package. And they get married and everything. Savage and, um... Savage and Liz get married. It's a beautiful thing. They also cut out the uh, the after party thing where Jake's snake popped up out of the present. It's like popping up out of a wedding cake, only with Venom. Um, And no, not the Eminem song from Venom. Now that song's stuck in my head. Moving on. This pay-per-view was odd. It ended kind of flatly, like really flatly. But there were some good moments on here. I really enjoyed the opener and the IC title match and over a couple of other things. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritland. I'll see you soon.